If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, the Lord has extended His invitation to you if you need to put on Christ in baptism. Or if you're here this morning and you're a Christian and you have wandered away from the fold of God and you'd like to come back, we want you to know that God's invitation is extended to you now as we stand and as we sing. Y'all understand? I, I halfway expected this whole kind of... And I told Gene so he didn't run up here real quick. But that's the end, right? When you hear me or Dan or some other preacher say, if you're here this morning and you're done, close the song, books, Bibles, shuffling, or that, that's the end of the sermon, right? That's when you can tune out. That's what we do. Blah, 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 27, 30, for 35 minutes, 45 minutes worth. I'll try to be short. Blah, 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 blah. If you're here this morning and you're... And that's, that's when we tune out. When you think about what an invitation is, from a public speaking point of view, an invitation is the conclusion. From a sermon perspective, that is the driving home point of the whole thing. The whole point of the sermon is, is making, is, is being driven home right there at the very end as a plea to get people to respond to what God wants them to do. The idea for this thing came to me. I was in the back shaking hands one time, and somebody said, you know what, you, you do the longest invitations any preacher I ever heard in my life. And that just got me to thinking. I wonder sometimes do we shortchange them, and I know some guys who just do that. If you're here this morning and you're a subject to the Lord's invitation, come now, and that's, that's 10 seconds. And I know some guys that go on for 10 or 15, that's half their lesson. Well, today it's going to be my whole lesson. Because sometimes we run past what we really need. Sometimes that little bit at the end where maybe we've got a whole sermon to devoted just to faithful Christians. Tonight we're going to be talking about how old we are. And I'm not going to ask you what it is, but how the Lord can use us. And that's not really an evangelistic sermon. So maybe we as preachers or whoever is, is, is doing this, maybe we just tack on a little bit for the non-Christians in the audience. And I try to make sure in my sermons that there's a little bit of something in there for everyone, but... What we want to do today is just take the whole time and deliver the invitation to make sure that we do it with its right and proper way so that everybody knows where they stand with God and what they need to do to rectify any situation that may be lacking in their life. So as we talk about the Lord's invitation this morning, if you're here and you're not a Christian, give me a minute, listen to me. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, why not? And there may be a lot of different answers for that question. You may be the first time walking in this building and we don't, you don't know what the Church of Christ is from any other denomination or religious group, and that's great. This is going to be a good place to start. You may be not a Christian because you've been sitting here and you've been putting it off and something's been holding you back. You may have a question about what you need to do in order to get to heaven, and we're going to talk about that. This morning, a Christian is a child of God, somebody who God has added to his church. We talk about Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, I will build my church. Ephesians 4, 4, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's one body. That body is the church. Ephesians chapter 1. How do you get to be a part of that body, the body of Christ? In Acts chapter 2, the Lord added to the church daily those that were being saved. We can't join a church. It doesn't work that way. There's only one true church that the Bible talks about. And that church is mentioned in the pages of Scripture in the New Testament. And the Lord will add us to His church as we are being saved, as we're doing the things that salvation requires. The first place that starts, and a lot of times we talk about it as the plan of salvation, the stairway to heaven, not the Led Zeppelin version, but the, the gospel version, the real one. There are steps you have to take, and those steps will lead you to heaven. It's accurate. 
to call it a stairway to heaven or the, the GPS, right, that gets you to where you're going. Gospel plan of salvation. The very first step, and it ought to make sense to us, is called hearing. We have to hear the Word of God. Matthew 7, verse 24, in the Sermon on the Mount at the very end, Jesus said, Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I liken unto a wise man who built his house upon the rock. The rains came, the floods came, the house stood firm. Whoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not, I liken unto a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. The rains came, the floods came, and as we say at VBS, the wise man's house went splat. It did not stand because it wasn't built on the rock. And how we build on the rock, Jesus said, whoever hears these sayings of mine and doeth them. Paul said in Romans chapter 10, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. How will you know what church Jesus built? How will you know what to do in order to inherit eternal salvation? How will you know what to do in order to live righteously if you don't first take time to hear the word of God? It's at the bottom for a reason. Each one of these steps is prerequisite to the one that comes before. We have to hear the Word of God, otherwise you won't do anything that's in it. My children, my wife, will not obey my voice if they don't first hear it, right? That's the easiest, that's what I did when I was a kid. You, you told me that, I didn't hear you tell me to take out the trash. You got to think, I, I wasn't a Christian when I was growing up, it was okay for me to lie, not really, I'm joking. But we do that, so I, did, I didn't hear. And now the older I get, legitimately, the less I hear. If I don't hear you say something, I'm not going to do what it is you asked me to do. If we don't first take time to hear the Word of God, to patiently open it and to see what it says, we're not going to do anything that it tells us to. That's why if you're here and you're not a Christian, I hope you take time this morning to hear the Word of God. I hope that you'll take time after you've heard the Word of God and looked into it. On your own or with someone else, we'd love to study with you. I hope that you take time to see who Christ is, that you open the New Testament and that you believe. John 8, 24, Jesus said, Unless you believe that I am Him, you will die in your sins. Who is He talking about? When John chapter 1, Jesus is introduced to us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Verse 14, and the word was made manifest or flesh and it dwelt amongst us. And we beheld the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. His only begotten Son. That's a, that's a very special thing. That is Christ. He is deity. He's not just Jesus of Nazareth. He's not just Jesus bar Joseph. He's not just Jesus, the son of Joseph. He is Jesus, the son of God. He's the son of man. He is the Messiah, the one that the Jews have been waiting for for so long. The one promised and prophesied from the beginning. We have to believe that Jesus is the Christ, but there are some in the religious world even some in the Christian, quote-unquote, world that do not believe that Jesus is truly part of the Godhead or divinity. There are some that teach other things concerning Jesus. Well, he was just a good man. And it'd be good for us to follow him because he's a good man, but he is the man, the Son of Man, the Son of God. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, it starts with hearing the fact that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the Christ, and that you have to believe in him. If I tell you to go out and do something that sounds crazy, if you don't believe in me, will you do that? No. But if I tell somebody to do something, you tell me something to do, if I believe you, I will take heed to what you say. And that's why we first have to hear and then we have to believe. It, it's strong. And it's vital that we do that. We have to believe that Jesus is the Christ, that he's the Son of God. Otherwise, what else are we going to do with our life? What are we going to do with our salvation? Will it matter? It won't matter at all because we don't believe that He's Christ. After we have heard the Word of God, we have to believe. And most of the religious world will get most all this right. Oh, you need to hear the Word of God. You need to believe in Christ. The next step is you have to repent. Are you willing to change your life? Listen to somebody who you don't believe in. If you don't believe that Jesus is the Christ, will you modify your whole life to be different than it was? 
unless you believe that he is something special. You see how each of these things build upon one another. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, this is where things really begin to be difficult. Well, I, I, I can read the Word of God. I, I already believe that Jesus is Christ. That's great. Are you willing to change your life based upon that belief? Because that's the real issue. Jesus talking about a current event, he said, Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Are you any worse a sinner than all these folks in whom the Tower of Siloam fell? I tell you, nay, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. There was this idea in the first century and even back through antiquity. Look at Job. Job, bad things happened to you. Why did bad things happen to you, Job? Because you're a sinner. Now, Job didn't believe that. He knew different, but that's, that's the mindset. This tower fell down and killed these 18 people. They must have been sin. They must have been horrible sinners. No. Bad things happen sometimes. It's the way the world works. It's the way it is. It doesn't make them any more evil than anyone else. But unless you repent, you will be spiritually dead just like they are. 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 10, we talk about how godly sorrow works repentance. Not worldly sorrow. Worldly sorrow is getting caught. Godly sorrow now worketh repentance. You believe that Jesus is the Christ. You believe that he's the Son of God. You believe that he died for your sins. And it's with that conviction that you feel that sorrow in your heart that you messed up and you messed up in front of God. It's not like I got caught stealing the cookie from the cookie jar and Mama busted me. I messed up in front of God, and I have pained God with my sin. So I've got to change. What does it mean to repent? Repentance is a U-turn, and we talk about it every time we mention repentance. It's driving southbound on 55, right, towards Memphis. Not implying anything about Memphis, but that's geologically logical for us. Geographically logical for us. We're driving southbound to Memphis. Repentance is getting off the interstate and coming northbound back towards St. Louis. It is a complete 180 degree change. A change in mind that leads to a change in action. We talk about that prodigal son, right? He made up his mind he was going to go and burn off his inheritance before he should have had it. But he came to himself. He realized in his mind that, hey, I have messed up. I am going to go back and I am going to beg my father to take me in, not as a son, but as a servant. And it's with that mindset that we see what repentance is. Jesus tells a parable of two sons. Dad told both of them to go out and work. One said, oh, y'all yeah, go out and work and did not. The other said, I'm not going to work and repented and did. That is repentance. It is a complete 180 degree change in your actions and behaviors based on this change in mindset you have. You ever lost weight? Some of y'all are trying to lose weight. I'm trying to lose weight. I had one lady tell me, he said, I've lost 500 pounds. Wow, really is yes, the same 25 over and over and over and over again. Repentance is making up your mind to lose the weight, getting rid of it, and keeping it off. That's, that's, that's repentance. Not having donuts and a Dr. Pepper every morning for breakfast. You know, it's just a complete lifestyle change. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, I ask you, are you willing to change your life around? Not just to accommodate Christ, but to be accommodating toward Christ. To just give yourself completely over to Him and say, whatever thy will is, that's what I want in my life. That's what He did in the garden right before the cross. That's what repentance is. Are you willing this morning, if you truly believe in Christ, to change your life? To quit doing the things that are sinful and start doing the things that are righteous? To live for Him and not for yourself? And boy, that's hard to do. Turn on the news. There are a lot of folks living for themselves right now in this world. Are you willing and ready to live for Christ? That's what repentance is. You need to confess Christ. When we do Bible studies with folks, especially when we go to Jamaica, we go through these, these same steps, the same plan of salvation. We say, hey, what, what, is, what does repentance mean? Well, folks got a general idea. What is confession? We got to confess your sins. And that's a very worldly concept, but it's not biblical. And the fact of what's going to salvation. Now, we need to confess our sins one to another for prayers and for encouragement. But Matthew 10 and verse 32, Jesus said, Whosoever confesseth me before my Father, him will I also confess before my Father which is in heaven. Whosoever deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Confession in this sense is an acknowledgement. Hey, do you know Jesus? Yes, I know Jesus. 
He died for me. I am one of His. I believe in Christ, and I will tell you all about Him. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Let's take a moment and let's read that together. If thou shalt confess with the mouth thy Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy hand that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Confession and belief tied here together. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, toward righteousness with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You're getting there, but you're not quite there yet. That's why each of these is prerequisite, and they all lead to contacting the blood of Christ in baptism. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. This like figure, 1 Peter 3.21, this like figure we're into even baptism doth also now save us. This is where some folks in the world just say, hold on now, hold on. Nobody's ever said you had to be baptized in order to go to heaven. Nobody ever said baptism saves you. If you're here this morning, you're not a Christian, and you haven't heard this before, I implore you to take a minute and look at it. Jesus said, who that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not. Did a Bible study with a man one time. See, it doesn't say anything about being baptized not. He that eateth and digesteth is full. He that eateth not is hungry. If you don't eat, will your stomach ever digest any food? No. If you don't believe in Christ, will you ever do what he says and be baptized? Well, no. No need to keep reiterating all the points. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. The like figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us. Talk about how God washed the sins of the world away with water and saved Noah and his family very external thing. God now does it internally through us, a type and a shadow. God will wash our souls, our inward parts clean with the water, contacting the blood of Christ in baptism. God had Ananias come and preach to Saul of Tarsus, who had been fasting and praying to God for three days. If anybody could be saved through fasting and prayer, it would be Saul, but he wasn't. Saul of Tarsus, who was on the road to Damascus in the dirt, looking at Jesus and said, what wilt thou have me to do? What do I need to do to make this right, Jesus? And Jesus said, well, Saul, you just accept me into your heart and you say this prayer, you'll be fine, buddy. Is that what he said? No, he said, go into the city. Jesus told him, go into the city and it shall be told thee what thou shalt do. Ananias came and preached the gospel to him, these things we just talked about. He immediately was baptized into Christ. Ananias said, what are you waiting for? Arise. Be baptized, wash away thy sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. We see to call upon the name of the Lord is to do His will, to rise and to be baptized. Dear friends, if you are here this morning and you have not done these things, then according to the gospel, you're not a Christian. I encourage you to look at this. The folks who have done this, Acts chapter 2, the Lord added to the church because they have been saved. You can't just say, how when I want to join this church. Y'all seem like a fun group of people. We are a fun group of people. You don't believe me, stick around for a few minutes and eat with us after a while. We're all kind of fun. But you just can't join us because we have really good food up there and we do. You can't join us because we do all sorts of cool stuff. You do what God says and he will add you to his church. If you're here this morning you're not a Christian, I implore you to look at that and to think about it. But we're going to take a, a second and we're going to turn, turn the tables a moment. If you're here this morning and you are a Christian, The Lord wants you to be faithful. That's really the sixth and final step on the plan of salvation. We hear God's word. We believe in Christ. We repent of our sins. We confess his name. We're baptized into Christ. Right? Galatians 3 verse 27. Romans 6, 1 through 6. We're baptized into Christ. We put on Christ. We're raised to walk in newness of life. Raised to walk in newness of life. You've got to be faithful unto death. Jesus said, and I will give thee a crown of life, Revelation 2 and verse 10. Well, Paul said, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. That is what being faithful is all about. What does it mean to be faithful even to the point of death? That means you finish your course. You run your race. You finish that fight. Hebrews writer said, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. It's not a sprint. You run out of gas too quick. It's a marathon. Being faithful, dear Christian, are you putting that spiritual foot one in front of another every single day? Some days we're running in our faith and some days we're walking, but God wants us to make progress. He wants us to be walking in the light, 1 John 1 and verse 7, right? 
Walk in the light as he is in the light. Have fellowship one with another. That's our fellowship with God, that vertical fellowship. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, continually cleanses us from all evil. As long as we are putting one foot in front of the other and walking in the light, we stay inside the blood of Christ. And that blood of Christ continually cleanses us from our sin. Sometimes we're going to sin and mess up, right? Romans 3 and verse 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's when we mess up, when we realize it, when we repent and ask forgiveness of God. Simon the sorcerer, we see in Acts chapter 8, he was obviously a Christian. We see where him and the rest of the town, he was in where they were baptized into Christ. And when he sinned, when he wanted to buy the laying on of hands from the apostles, he didn't say, well, man, you done messed up, too bad. You had one shot, you blew it, buddy. He didn't say, oh, man, you sinned, we got to baptize you all over again. He said to Simon, he said, repent. Pray to God that the thought of your heart can be forgiven of you. Once we're baptized into Christ, we've contacted His blood, we've been added to the church. When we mess up, when we're not quite as faithful as we need to be, when we're not walking in the light, we have that power of prayer and repentance to make sure our lives are changed and stay changed and to pray to God so that those things can be forgiven us. Walking in the light means avoiding walking in the dark, which you think would go really hand in hand, but sometimes we just focus on one or the other. If you're here this morning and you're a Christian, how are you walking in the light? And I think about this sometimes. We're all, myself included, not as faithful as we can be sometimes. Are we walking in the light? Or are we walking down? You ever seen a kid walk down the hall? I'm sorry, Tom, I'm touching the walls. I'm walking and I'm just trailing my fingers in the light here a little bit. I'm still touching it, Lord. No. We're walking in darkness, and we're just token, a token effect of putting our hand there in the light. Sometimes we've got one foot in the light and one foot in the darkness. God wants us to walk in the light and avoid. Abstain from every appearance of evil, 1 Thessalonians 5, 22. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, dealing with some very specific sin there. In Corinth, he said, flee fornication. You know what it looks like to flee fornication? Turn back to Genesis and look at Joseph in Potiphar's house. The King James says he got him gone. You ever seen uh, the roadrunner take off with the wheel spinning and the, the cloud of dust? Now, I don't know if there was a cloud of dust and Joseph's feet were turning like a cartoon, but that's the image. That's the image in Genesis that we're supposed to have. Took off so fast he left his coat in her hands. He got him gone. Flee fornication, avoid every appearance of evil. Love your neighbor as yourself. I don't care who they voted for. Love your neighbor as yourself. I don't care what it is they've done to you or against you or for you. But dear Christian, it is so easy to walk in the darkness, to be just like everybody else in the world. And if you're here this morning and that, that sums up what you're doing, well, I'm walking, and I came to church. That's where we stick our hand out, and we kind of touch the light as well. I'm doing everything the world's doing. But we kind of token pay our respects to God. If you're here this morning, and you're a Christian, and that's what you're doing, I pray that you think about it. Are you walking in the light? I forgot completely Ephesians 5, 8. Let's go look at that. Ephesians 5 and verse 8. Paul's words here to the church at Ephesus. He says, For you were sometimes in darkness, but you are now light. In the Lord. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. If we're doing all that, we're going to worship properly. God is a Spirit, and they that worship Him must worship in the truth, because the hour comes and now is. Well, they will worship God, Spirit and the truth. Paul said at the very end of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, let everything be done decently and in order. What's that mean? That means you can do things not decently and not in order. When it comes to the worship of the church, let's do it decently and in order. The way God says. God has given us specific things that we do. Every Lord's Day when we come together, if you're here this morning, back enough a bit, if you're not a Christian, you're like, man, I missed the band somewhere. Maybe they keep it in that door back there. I don't know. There's no guitars or drums or pianos or organs back there. You look at the first century church, they just sang. 
using nothing but their voice because that's what God wanted. He said, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. When he did that, he excluded all other means of worshiping him. The first century church got together every first day of the week, every Lord's Day, every Sunday, what we call it on our calendar. That's why we get together every Sunday. They partook of the Lord's Supper. You're like, man, we don't do this but once or twice a year in my congregation, my church. Well, the Bible says we're supposed to do it every first day of the week. Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 20, so many other places. We hear God's Word being proclaimed in Bible classes and from the pulpit here from preaching. We pray without ceasing every time we get together. We give of our means to support the work of the church. We don't have bake sales and other things because the church supports itself. That's what the Bible teaches us. We have to worship properly, and if that's new to you, I'm glad you're here. And can you experience You can experience it. But if you're here this morning and you're a Christian and your friends and your family are doing something else and that pulls you away, you're not alone. The entire book of Hebrews is written to a people that are being pulled away to go back into Judaism. Judaism was cool. They had these priests with these robes and they did all these things and it was, it was neat. Christianity is a very simple religion. It's divine to be a very simple religion. Not in doctrine, not in effect, but, you know, I don't have any special robes. I didn't come out in fog machines and lights. There is no lot of drama in theater. It's, it's just us worshiping God the way that it should be. But if you have friends and family members that are trying to pull you away, Christian, think about that we have to worship Him properly. And we have to be an example. And sometimes that's where, that's where we have a hard time. Paul said, be ye followers of me, even as I am also of Christ. And Paul told Timothy, but it's good for everybody else too, let no man despise you, right? He said, for your youth, but for your Christianity, for your faith, let nobody despise you. Be thou an example of the believers in word, in manner of life, in love, in spirit, your attitude, in faith, and in purity. Every way you have, be an example of the believers. If you're here this morning and you're a Christian and any of these things speak to you, I pray that you take just a minute and you think about it. Think about these things because God is extending His invitation. The Lord's invitation is extended to you. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian and you just you want to know more about Christ and His church, I invite you to come forward. Because I don't know that I've ever explained this, and I don't know that I've ever heard another preacher explain this, right? Because we're generally talking to Christians. But let me explain to you what's going to happen here in the next 20 to 30 minutes. I'm joking, I'm joking. In just a minute, I will for real say as we stand and sing, just not because that is the official way you have to end your sermon, but because that's our, that lets everybody in the audience know that we need to stand. Why do we stand up during the invitation? Because it's very hard sometimes for us to stand up out in that aisle and walk forward. What if everybody else is sitting down and you're the only person that stands up and then just... I think we stand up because it helps people. You're already up. All you got to do is move forward. So in a minute, we're going to stand up. We're going to sing a song of encouragement. Gene will lead us in that. And that gives you an opportunity to come forward. Myself and one of the elders will be standing here. If you want to know more about the Bible and you're not a Christian and you just want to study God's Word and see what it says, maybe something has opened your eyes up a little bit today and say, I I've never heard that. I want to do that more. We invite you to come forward. Let that need be known. If you have been holding off, the Lord has extended His invitation. If you have been holding off, you have a chance right now to make that right with Him. If you've heard this stuff before and for whatever reason, you just keep sitting there and you say, no, 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 no. Let today be the day you say yes to God. It's not my invitation. It's not the elder's invitation. It's the Lord's invitation we're going to stand up and that's going to give you a chance to come forward if you've been doing those things you want to be baptized into christ that would make it a great great day i love leaving here with wet shirt sleeves wet pants sloshing water out the baptistry we did that wednesday night didn't we i love that that's great that's the best way to end a sunday let today the day be you say yes if you're here this morning and you're a christian why walk out like everything's okay when in your heart right now you know it's not we're standing up, Gene's singing, I'm standing right down here. We are ready for you to come forward. You know what you need to do to get right. You know what you need to do to get right. You have a chance to make your life right with him. Let's be standing. As the Lord extends his invitation, here's your chance to make your life right with God for real. As we stand and as we sing.
David.